Every day, 911 dispatchers do their best to protect and serve the public. But sometimes the calls they get make that job very difficult. At 11.25 a.m. on the morning of November 10th, 1989, in Newington, Connecticut, police dispatcher Paul Jensen got just such a call. Newington Police. This 911? Yes. Okay, listen, I'm calling from the Robbins Avenue in Newington. Mm -hmm. I'm making a citizen's arrest on two felons in here. I've got them in the back room. I'll release them only to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. What is going on? At first I thought it might be a hoax, but something in his voice told me that he really was meaning what he said. I'm holding a, a, a gun on two hostages here who uh, are, are guilty of mail fraud, among other things. And I won't release it to anyone but the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It didn't make too, too much sense. He was talking about uh, various felonies and federal crimes that had been committed. It didn't sound logical for the town of Newington to have people doing this. You're holding a gun on these people? That's right. This is at Robbins Avenue? That's right. Where in the heck is that? It's between Willard and uh, Maple Hill. Willard and Maple. It's a private house? Private. Right. Okay. I had to go on the assumption that it wasn't a crank call, and I had to work to get people out to the scene. Okay, I'll send some uh, people over. Okay, right. I will not release them to anyone but the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Right. I have to talk with the sergeant on that. Right. Okay. District 3 and District 1. We have a While on patrol seven, nearby, seven, Newington seven. Police Officer Michael Tack was sent to the scene. On the way. I uh, received a call that a man was holding two people at gunpoint for a minor violation, which is an extreme overreaction to the situation. So I arrived at the scene looking for trouble. When I got there, I met a uh, occupant of the house who came out, and he told me that his brother was holding his other two brothers hostage in the back corner of the house. I made my way through the house slowly, and I worked my way towards the bedroom where I heard the suspect screaming and yelling. I got you guys for a male for a conspiracy. Turn away. Put your hands on the floor. Police! What's going on in there? Officer, I'm making a citizen's arrest. I got two guys in here for mail fraud. I'm not going to release them to anybody but the FBI. The most difficult problem is he holds all the cards. If he wants to kill those people, he's going to do it. I need you here. I called for a backup, and negotiators were also dispatched to the scene. Within minutes, local detectives Jim Lavery and Richard Gable got to the house. The house looked just like uh, any of the other houses on the street. There was no people around. Michael, Officer Tack pointed out the bedroom door that he was behind. Jimmy took up position directly across from that room and uh, tried to start a dialogue with him. Hey, in there. Who's that? This is Jim Lavery from the police department. How are you? All right, Jim. I, I want to talk to the FBI. I don't want to talk to you. What, what, what are you up to, man? I, got, I have two guys under arrest here for mail fraud. Billy was very, very agitated and screaming and yelling, mostly yelling at his brothers. Turn around. Turn around. It was a dangerous situation in is that we had a man in a room with two other hostages with a loaded gun and we didn't know for sure what he was going to do with it. But he was going to shoot them, come out at us, or just exactly how he was going to handle it. I tried to talk to the two brothers, but he wouldn't let me talk to them. The Gable brought me down to the telephone. We called Lieutenant Cotter, let him know what was going on so he could take his action. The head of detectives, Lieutenant William Cotter, set up a command post at the Newington Police Station. These situations are horror shows. Sometimes officers are shot, and naturally the risk is always high to the uh, hostages. Additional police officers were sent to secure the scene. Detective Layer continued to talk to the individual, but by in time we hoped that he would give it up and let us, uh, let us come in there. We are trying to establish a rapport with the individual, a friendly report with him to, uh, and a trust with him. Is anybody in there hurt? Nobody is hurt. Jim, where's the FBI? It was Veterans Day, so all the federal buildings were closed, and uh, we were trying to buy time by convincing him that, you know, it's tough to find the FBI or people that are out on a holiday like that. The FBI's answering service is on, so I'm trying. Jim, it's 1235. 
Uh, I want somebody here from the Federal Bureau of Investigation by 1 o'clock or I'm sending one of these guys out in a body bag. Gable noticed that Billy was 10 minutes ahead of all of us. Lieutenant, he just gave us an ultimatum at 1 o'clock. He's going to shoot somebody as well. As soon as they were given the first ultimatum, yeah. Lieutenant Cotter called in the state police SWAT team. But they knew the SWAT team would never get to the I'd house like to in time. The tactical team unit to be a response to an incident we have in our community. Jimmy, time is ticking away. We're trying as hard as we can, but you got to give me some leeway, man. It's a holiday. Jim, don't play games with me. You got until 1 o'clock, that's all I can give you. The most difficult part of the job is just keeping the fella peaceful enough where he doesn't hurt anybody or himself. And everything seemed to be working good, and it looked like we were going to get a shot to get through the deadline. Where's the FBI, Jim? Just take Jim. it easy. We'll get him here no problem at all. I got two guys in here for mail fraud. Billy! 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 What did you do? He was in the middle of a sentence to me. It was like the second hammer bite of 12 and he just popped him. I thought that that was the end, that he was going to finish uh, both brothers within the, within the room and possibly even do himself. I got one in the head. I'm going to get that one in the head next time, Jim. Billy, you be quiet. I want to talk to who you uh, shot. Are you all right? Yeah. Where did you get shot? In the hand. All right, Billy, I want you to bandage his hand for him. He uh, wrapped a bandage of some sort around Ned's wrist. Ned said he was going to bleed to death if he didn't tighten it a little bit more. Are you doing it? Yes. Huh? Yes. We thought about going into the room, but we felt that if we had gone in at that time, he would have shot both of them again. Jim, I shot one in the head. The next one I'm shooting in the head. He told us that there was going to be another shooting, that he was going to soon set another time for another shooting because uh, it didn't seem like we were serious in what we were doing. On negotiations continued. Down at the station, the gunman's other brother was questioned by the SWAT commander. The door swing this way. Brian was helpful to us in that he was able to give us the layout of the house, and give us some uh, indication what kind of a handgun he had, and uh, what the bedroom was, what the furniture was in the room. Where's Brian? It's down at headquarters. I want to talk to Brian. Billy wanted Brian brought right back to the house. It took a while because they were still trying to debrief him at headquarters. When we finally got him there, Brian was very, very, very nervous. You all right, Brian? So he would ask him a simple question, and Brian would just kind of stand there and panic and not know what to say, so Dick would have to whisper the answer to him. Hey, Brian, you got a cookbook out there? Yeah. Yeah, Billy, I, yeah. Well, look up roast pork. He was asking him if he had a cookbook so that he could cook the roast pork, meaning the two brothers that were in there on Sunday when he got done killing them. You know, all, all kind of really off the wall stuff. As time went on, he asked less and less for Brian, and we started to phase Brian out as much as possible because Brian was very, very emotional. At 2.30, he gave us the deadline. You got until, until 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, one gets shot in the head. I never felt in my mind ever that he wasn't going to fire, that he wasn't going to shoot. Less than 20 minutes were left before the second deadline, but the SWAT team was still being briefed at the command post. There's a briefcase in my bedroom. Maybe about quarter to three. He said that he had a briefcase in his room and he wanted us to get the briefcase and slide things under the door to him. He said the FBI would want to see these particular papers. Those were important to make his case against his, uh, his brothers. Here it is now, Billy. I have no idea what they were. They had numbers on them. Some had, some were hotel receipts. Some were uh, just scribbling on them. It didn't seem a good way to stall till the uh, state police could get there. No, 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 there's one more I think I'm missing. There was no communication between the hostages and us. We didn't have any idea at that particular time if they were alive or dead. They got a lot of white pieces of paper. Tell me what's on it. Closing in on 3 o'clock, Jim. The SWAT commander came in. He said that his men were deploying at that time and that we had 10 minutes till the deadline. And that's when I explained to him that we didn't have 10 minutes. We probably had a minute left because Bill was operating 10 minutes fast and 10 minutes faster than everyone else. The state police negotiator walked down the hallway and handed me a note. As I was reading the note, I was passing things under the door to him that he wanted. Billy, you got Diversion! Diversion! Get down! 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 Get down!
Don't move! Don't move! We didn't know who was who. Uh, we were looking for blood to see who was shot and who wasn't. Okay, come on. I'm okay. It's all right. The officers took the only brother who wasn't shot into custody. Paramedics were then allowed to treat the wounded brothers, both of whom were shot in the hand. Nice and easy. Nice and easy. Get his feet up in the air. Get him on some O2 and give me a set of vitals. Is this the only wound he has? When it's over, you're completely exhausted. You have no recall, really, of what you did. You really have a difficult time remembering what you talked about. I consider both hostages very lucky. Very, very lucky. I don't think it would have ended with the FBI. I think he was bound and determined. He was unstable enough at the time to do what he was going to do. Billy was declared incompetent to stand trial and committed to not more than 10 years in a maximum security mental hospital. His two brothers whom he wounded were treated and released later that same day. One year later, Ned and Tim reflect back on that day and its unanswered questions. It really wasn't my brother there. It was somebody that I didn't know. I'm not sure what happened to Billy, other than the fact that I know he had a lot of problems over Vietnam. He was on the front lines over there. And for whatever reason, whether it was Vietnam or whatever, I just hope he gets help and the help that he needs. As far as I'm concerned, the reason I'm here today is because of the Newington police, and in particular, Jim Lavery. There were numerous times when Billy had gotten out of control to the point where I didn't think I'd ever get out of there alive. And Jim and Detective Gable calmed him down. They're brave individuals, uh, the people who rescued us. They knew going in that there was an individual in there with a gun, and they came in anyways. Oh! Tim and I, when we were growing up, we were always fighting each other. He was a Yankee fan, I was a Red Sox fan, and uh, we we're closest in age, and we always used to, always used to tangle. But after this, uh, there's probably nobody closer than me and Tim. The bond is, is, is very close and unbreakable. Mm -hmm.